This is going to be Genesis chapter 32. Verse by verse for Genesis 32. Genesis 32, 1. And Jacob went on his way. This would have been from Gilead to the land of Canaan. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. The angels will minister to Jacob, help him, and give him some comfort. It says in Hebrews 1, 14, Are they not all ministering spirits? sent forth to minister for them who should be heirs of salvation. The angels are ministering spirits. God sends them uh, in the Bible to help and comfort. And they're also warriors in the Bible. Not just messengers, as some people teach, but these angels are possibly the same ones that were in Jacob's dream back in Genesis twenty-eight twelve. And have you ever seen a movie or a TV show where somebody visits someone in a dream and then showed up in their physical life. Well, that already happened in the Bible here with Jacob and these angels. And when Jacob saw them in verse 2, he said, This is God's host. And he called the name of that place Mahanaim. So Jacob saw them with his own two eyes. And he knew right away that it was angels. He wasn't entertaining them unawares, as some people do. Uh, he knew it was angels. And that word Mahanaim means two hosts two hosts or two camps even if you think you only have a few men on your team there is more with the saint than what the lost has with them when you consider god and his angels you got more with you on your side than the lost has with them and if god opened your eyes then you would see it just like in 2 Kings 6, 16 through 17, Elisha says, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. So if you could just see the numbers around you, it's a, it's a lot more than the lost people have. In Romans 8.31, it says, What shall we then say to these things if God be for us? Who can be against us? Jacob saw the angels and said, This is God's host, like his army. The angels aren't just messengers, they're warriors. And even the angels of God themselves couldn't stop Jacob from being afraid of Esau. I mean, think about it. If you got all these angels with you, are you going to be afraid? Well, Jacob still was afraid. So look what he does in verse 3. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. So Jacob is so afraid of Esau that he even sends messengers to contact him before he has to meet him. And these messengers are just sent to make sure that Jacob isn't going to run into any trouble whatsoever with Esau. So the next verse, he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have so sojourned with Laban, and stayed there until now. So Jacob's even going to tell them what, what to say to Esau. And he wants them to tell him that he's been sojourning with Laban. So if he's sojourned, that just means he just stayed temporarily. But it means he stayed a while. It was temporary, but it was like 20-something years. But notice he wants the messengers to say, Thy servant Jacob to Esau. He's really want, wanting to butter him up and lay it on thick and suck up to him. And it says in verse 5, he wants them to say, And I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants, and I have sent to tell my Lord that I may find grace in thy sight. Jacob is... Uh, Probably He probably wants Esau to know he has all this great abundance of things now because he doesn't want Esau to think that he needs to take anything else from Esau. Because, you know, he's already took a lot from Esau, and that's why he ran from him. But he wants to find grace in the sight of Esau, meaning he wants to get something from Esau that he doesn't deserve. He wants to find unmerited favor in the sight of Esau. And he knows that Esau fell prey to his trickery before, and he really doesn't deserve anything from him. So if Esau is good to him, it's, it's going to be because he finds grace in his sight. 
So it says in verse 6, And the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to thy brother Esau, and also he cometh to meet thee, and four hundred men with him. Imagine Jacob's face when he hears that Esau is coming with four hundred men. I mean, numbers mean nothing when God is on your side. He may have four hundred men, but what does Jacob have? He's got all those angels. You'll find over and over in the scriptures how God and one man is the majority because of what that one man has backing him. J Jacob is just lacking a lot of faith, just like me and you lack it half the time. It says in verse 7, Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that was with him in the flocks and the herds and the camels into two bands. And Jake, you see, Jacob isn't relying on the Lord. He is coming up with his own plans to preserve himself. Notice that he's not even prayed yet at this point. But you see, God had given these angels. God had already promised Jacob that he was going to get him home safely back in Genesis 28, 15. God sent two camps of angels to protect him back in verse 1. Uh, God stopped Laban from hurting him in Genesis 31, 24. It's as if Jacob is doing all he can to stay afraid. In Genesis 32, 8, it says, and, it, and said, If Esau come to the one company and smite it, then the other company which is left shall escape. So Jacob is so faithless that he's certain that a good portion of his people is going to die. So he's dividing his family up into two parts. I guess one for each camp of angels. But doesn't he realize if they all work together that they would be stronger? Now finally, he's going to pray. He planned first and he prayed second. Not a good order of things. It says in verse 9, And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham, and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidest unto me, Return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I would deal well with thee. Remember, it's the Lord that told him to return back. So why would the Lord not protect him from Esau on the way back to where he told him to go? Uh, there's a saying that I heard a long time ago that said if the Lord wants you to go to it, he'll bring you through it, or something like that. That should apply to Jacob. Jacob is relying Jacob is relying on his own plans and preparations before he even went to prayer with God. And he's just replaying the promises the Lord gave him back to God. He said in O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidest unto me, returning to thy kindred. He's telling the Lord what the Lord already said to him. And this is actually good biblical praying. A good prayer is using the words of God in the prayer to God. That way you know it's a good prayer. I mean, if you take things God said to you in the Bible and you pray using those words, then you know it's a good biblical prayer. You aren't reminding the Lord of anything. He didn't forget that he said it. It's just, it's good and right to repeat back to God what's he, what he's already told you. Now, Jacob is really going to get down to business here. And I like what he says in verse 10. He says, I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast shown unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. Uh, he, that's a good confession. He's not worthy of all the mercy and truth. We aren't worthy of all the mercy and truth. Jacob's going to get somewhere with this attitude. He admits he's not worthy. He's not worthy of God's mercies. He's not worthy of He's not worthy for God to keep Esau from killing him. He isn't worthy of all the truth that the Lord has revealed to him personally and all the words of God that's been given to him. He's not worthy of receiving all the things that God's given him over the past 20 years with Laban. And he came over this Jordan with just a staff, and now he has enough to make up two bands. In Genesis 32, 11, it says, Deliver me, I pray thee, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. You see, Jacob may fear God, but right now he's fearing man a whole lot more. And the Bible says in Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. I don't know if it's of great significance, but Jacob says, he only, he only says mother in the singular. He actually had four women 
with him who had mothered some of his children, Leah, Rachel, Bilhah, and Zilpah. And I think he mostly was only concerned with one of them, and that was Rachel. He shows partiality a lot. He, so he says, lest he will come and smite me and the mother with the children. So he's really only seems to be concerned with Rachel. He cares about himself and Rachel more than anybody, I believe. It says in verse 12, And thou saidest, I will surely do thee good, and make thy seed as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. That's what the Lord had promised him. And if God promised to make him, to make his seed as the sand of the sea, then obviously he was going to preserve his family and him and keep them from being killed. See, Jacob knows the promises, and something in him believes them, but in situations like this, his faith just goes to pieces, and me and you are like that many times. We believe the Bible, but when we get in that situation, sometimes what we believe just goes out the window, and we start letting fear overtake us. It says in verse 13 of Genesis 32, And he lodged there that same night, and took of that which came to his hand a present for, his, for Esau his brother. See, all this preparation to keep Esau from killing him, it was, it's, you're going to see it's just nonsense. Jacob relied on preparation and planning more than prayer. He's going to give Esau three droves of cattle. Look at all this that he's going to give him in verses 14 through 16. He's going to give him 200 she-goats and 20 he-goats and 200 ewes and 20 rams 30 milk camels and their colts, 40 kine and 10 bulls, 20 she-asses and 10 foals. And he delivered them into the hand of his servants, every drove by themselves, and said unto his servants, Pass over before me, and put a space betwixt drove and drove. So there were three droves of animals and three guys over them. And Jacob wants there to be a space between each one of these droves. So probably because so Esau can be appeased by one drove, then have time to think, and then be appeased by another, and then appeased by another, and then by the time he gets to Jacob, he's going to be pretty happy because he's got all this stuff. He's wanting Esau to just to be as soft and tender-hearted towards him as he can be by the time they make contact with each other. I mean, Jacob knows he's done some wrong to Esau. He knows he needs to appease the wrath of Esau. Now, you as a sinner, you know that you've wronged the Lord. And you see, many men will send the Lord gifts in the form of good works and good deeds in an attempt to appease the Lord's wrath. But it won't work. You're going to see in Genesis 33, 9 that Esau doesn't need any of Jacob's gifts. And he even goes as far as saying that he already has enough and just keep all that stuff. You see, the Lord's like that. He doesn't need anything that you can give him. He's got enough. What, but what but you need is what he can give you. You need what he can give you, but he doesn't need what you can give him. He has given the gift to you that will appease his wrath, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. Genesis thirty two seventeen, And he commanded the foremost, saying, when Esau my brother meeteth thee, and asketh thee, saying, Who art, Whose art thou, and whither goest thou, and whose are these before thee? You see, the foremost is the one that had charge of the first drove of cattle. Then thou shalt say, They be thy servant Jacob's. It is a present sent unto my lord Esau, and behold, also he is behind us. So he is going to send gifts to go before him, so that it might soften the anger of Esau, before he actually meets up with him. And he wants to, the men to tell Esau that he is behind us, referring to Jacob. Jacob is behind us. You know, because Esau may think he's too chicken to meet him face to face. And he is, he is acting like a big chicken. And so it says in verse 19, And so commanded he the second and the third and all that followed the drove, saying, On this manner shall you speak and Esau when you find him. On this manner shall you speak unto Esau when you find him. So the second and third are those who had the care of the second and third droves. Droves were the were the, just the collections of cattle that were, were driven, the, the ones that they're given to Esau as a present to appease him. 
He's telling them exactly what to say, and he wants everyone's story to be straight. See all this preparation and time and effort and money really are giving of possessions that Jacob has given away just to appease Esau's wrath. He says, and say ye moreover, behold, thy servant Jacob is behind us. For he said, I will appease him with the present that goeth before me. And afterward, I will see his face. Peradventure, he will accept of me. Notice that peradventure, he will accept of me, meaning maybe he will accept me and maybe he won't. You see, Jacob has no assurance in his mind about his future. He can picture a saint who is struggling to find assurance of salvation. He's sending all this stuff before him in an effort to appease Esau. Just like somebody who doesn't have assurance of salvation is doing all these good works just for the purpose of appeasing the Lord, but at the same time, he's not sure whether it's going to be even good enough to appease the Lord. He has no assurance. You see, God has already given Jacob promises that shows that he's going to be preserved, just like me and you as the born-again believers have already been given promises that shows we're going to be preserved. We just have to trust the promises. We don't have to say, per adventure, the Lord will accept me. We already know he accepts us. Verse 21, So he went, so went the present over before him, and himself lodged that night in the company. So Jacob pictures a saint who doesn't have enough faith to believe the promise of eternal salvation. So he tries to give presents. Like a, a, a believer who doesn't have assurance, he tries to give presents in the form of good works to the Lord to try to appease his wrath. This is what Jacob's doing with Esau. He's trying to appease the wrath of Esau with gifts, even though he has promises already from God that he's going to be safe, and he doesn't have to worry about Esau. Verse 22, And he rose up that night and took his two wives and his two women servants and his eleven sons and passed over the ford Jabbok. And that's not a new ford model. It, but you see, his two wives, Leah and Rachel, his two lesser wives, the women servants, the handmaidens, Zilpah and Bilhah, and his eleven sons, and obviously his daughter, Dinah. We know that she went with him because she shows up with him later. But you see, they pass over the Ford Jabbok, and this isn't a new Ford model called the Ford Jabbok. You see, if it's fordable, then it is water that you can pass through it on foot. And Jabbok, that word means emptying. He passed over the Ford Jabbok. He passed over water that was shallow enough to touch the bottom. Genesis thirty-two twenty-three, and he took them and sent them over the brook, and sent them sent over that he had. So Jacob sends over all of his people, and all of his goods, and this will picture. This is going to picture a man getting alone with God in prayer. He sent them over. For a while, I thought he was sending them over before him because he was just too scared to go. But now I see he's, he's picturing somebody that's getting along with God in prayer. Now for a great, the great wrestling match, as they call it. It says in Genesis thirty-two twenty-four, 24, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. So Jacob was alone there. But you see, no one is ever really alone. He was left alone in the sense that there was no mortals around him. But even when you're alone, there are spirits present, and they see what you're doing. And this is going to be a picture of a saint getting alone and wrestling with God in prayer. It says in verse 25, And when he saw that he prevailed not against him. Now this is the man that's wrestling with Jacob, that's prevailing not against Jacob. It says he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. So... Jacob is actually, even though he's kind of a chicken, he's a pretty tough character because he's still wrestling with a guy, even though his thigh is out of joint, it's got to be painful. So this man saw that Jacob was prevailing against him. So what he does is he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and made it out of joint. And this would have shown Jacob that the man he was wrestling with was, that the, the man he was wrestling with was not just a regular man because if a regular man touched your thigh, it's not going to put it out of joint, you see. And he could have, 
he could have paralyzed Jacob if he wanted to. And you see, this, this touch affected Jacob's walk. You see, this isn't just an ordinary man here. This is an angel of the Lord. It's a pre-incarnate appearance of the Lord Jesus. And see, the touch affected Jacob's walk. And if you come in contact with the Lord, then it's going to affect your spiritual walk. You see, it's going to cause you to walk humbly before God. Just like this touch to Jacob is going to cause him to walk more humbly. And notice Jacob says in verse, or this man says in verse 26, and he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he, Jacob, said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. See, this picture is a saint who doesn't give up on praying because, you see, he wants an answer. He wants a blessing from the Lord here. See, most likely Jacob knew this just wasn't a regular man anymore after the, he touched his thigh and it put it out of joint. He knows this is the Lord here. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. You see, the angel of the Lord asked him his name because the last time someone asked his name, he lied and said Esau. Remember, he lied to his father and said that he was Esau when he was really Jacob. And he said, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. And see, this is why they call the Jews the children of Israel. Because they're coming from Jacob, whose name is Israel. So Jacob went from having a name that meant supplanter, heel catcher, or deceiver, to having a name like Israel, which means prince of God. Now the archangel Michael, at this time I believe the archangel Michael is assigned to Jacob and his seed. It says in Daniel 12, 1, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth before the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble. So Michael, he's, he stands with Israel. Also keep in mind that the Lord said, Jacob has power with God. This should easily push Jacob over the edge with assurance and confidence and fearlessness when it comes to men, but it doesn't. I mean, he's got angels backing him, and he's got Michael the archangel backing him. The fact that Jacob isn't fearless with all of this power of God and promises and blessings and angels and, and servants he's got, it makes me ad admire the man Joshua even more. I mean, check out the, the promise that God gave to Joshua in Joshua 1.5, where he says, There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. What a great promise to Joshua. And I used to think, well, Joshua was only fearless and so tough because he had this promise there in verse 5. But then I got to thinking, when I got to Jake, really studying about Jacob, just because you've been promised something from God, doesn't mean you're going to have enough faith to be fearless like Joshua was. You see, Joshua, he had a lot more faith in the words of God than Jacob had. He could have easily been like Jacob and been afraid anyway because something in him really didn't believe those promises. You see, we got all these promises in the Bible that we can't lose our salvation, that we're eternally secure, that God is going to take care of us, that all things work together for the good to them that love God. You see, we got these promises. We just make we need to make sure that we're using them, that we really believe them, and then we're going to be fearless. We're going to be bold as a lion, as the Bible says. It says in verse twenty nine, and Jacob asked him and said, "Tell me, I pray thee, thy name." And he said, "Wherefore is it that thou dost ask after my name?" And he blessed him there. You see, when Jacob asked his name, he didn't tell him. There was another time when someone asked the angel of the Lord what his name was, and he said in Judges thirteen eighteen, And the angel of the Lord said unto him, Why askest thou thus after my name, seeing it is secret? And Moses also asked the Lord's name in Exodus three thirteen through 14, and he told Moses to tell them, I am. If they ask my name, tell them that I, my name is I am. Say that I am, that I am sent me. You remember that? But the angel of the Lord, he says, you know, why hast thou after my name, sing it secret? 
But it says in verse 30, And Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. So P Peniel means face of God. And notice how it defines what that what the name is in the verse where it says, I have seen God face to face. The Bible's got its own built-in dictionary. But God obviously let him win the wrestling match. I mean, he didn't really beat God in a wrestling match. Just It's just like you let your kid win the wrestling match. You know, when you play fighting with your kid, you always let him win, right? In Hosea 12, 3 through 4, it says, He took his brother by the heel in the womb. This is talking about Jacob. And by his strength, he had power with God. That's referring to this wrestling match. Yeah, he had power over the angel. See, showing you it's the angel of the Lord. He had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spake with us. So that is the angel of the Lord, a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. Obviously, Jacob could never beat the angel of the Lord in a wrestling match. But just like I let my son knock me down when we pretend to be sumo wrestlers, the Lord can pretend to let Jacob prevail. I mean, he touched the hollow of his thigh and put it out of joint. He could have touched any part of him and put his whole body out of joint. Verse 31, And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and he halted upon his thigh. So the, th the sun rose upon him, and it kind of reminds you of how Israel gets in a wrestling match in the tribulation, gets banged up. You see, Jacob just got in a wrestling match, got banged up, but then the sun rises on them. That's what's going to be, be like for Israel in tribulation. They go through the time of Jacob's trouble. But then what happens at the end? In Malachi 4, 2, But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings. You see, the sun's going to rise up on him just like it does for Jacob after this wrestling match. But it says, and he halted upon his thigh. In verse 30, when he halted upon his thigh, you see that he halted. He had to stop walking because of the pain. I mean, I guess the adrenaline of the wrestling match kept him from realizing how bad hurt that he was. But now he's, he's hurting. And it's kind of like the Lord gave him a thorn in the flesh there to try and humble him. And, you know, just like, you know, you come in contact with the Lord, it's going to humble you in your spiritual walk. And we say that the Lord let Jacob win. But if you think about it, the Lord left without a scratch. But Jacob has this thorn in his flesh from then on. This can picture how the flesh will give you trouble even after meeting the Lord. See, even after you get saved, get right with God, some of the things that happen to your flesh will haunt you to you the, the day you die. One day you believed on Jesus Christ. He saved your soul, not your flesh. And the flesh will cause you trouble until the rapture or until you die. In physical, mental, and sinful pain. Genesis 32, 32. Therefore the children of Israel eat not of the sinew which shrank. That's the muscle which is upon the hollow of the thigh to this day because he touched the hollow of Jacob's thigh and the sinew that shrank. You see, abstaining from eating the sinew which shrank is a reminder to the Jews of Jacob's encounter with God. And where it says no one eats it, eats of it unto this day, you see, unto this day, this day is referring to when Moses actually wrote this. No one eats of it, no one eats of the hollow of the thigh unto this day. You see, Moses wrote Genesis, so unto this day would be referring to to Moses there but this was a great chapter Genesis chapter 32 and we'll get in next time Genesis 33 where Jacob is finally gonna meet up with Esau